continuing on in module 28 we have 28 B on bipolar disorders uh, let me go here a mood disorder remember it's a mood disorder because we're in the whole mood and affect so a mood disorder characterized by manic hypomanic and depressive episodes and all those terms should makes sense because we've discussed them on the previous module and exemplar. No definitive cause, although they think factors contributing are genetic, physiological, environment, and psychosocial, like a combination of all. Usually appears between the ages of 15 and 30. Risk factors, family history, drug abuse, stress, major life-altering event. There is, although between 15 and 30 doesn't mean it cannot be visible or diagnosed earlier or later, they are beginning to see more of, a, of an appearance as people are getting older. And a lot of people will call themselves bipolar and they are not bipolar as we go further you'll have a better understanding because less than two percent of the population actually has the diagnosis of true bipolar disorder um, they found that the prefrontal cortex with your mood and behavior is actually smaller and has less function in the individual that is diagnosed as bipolar Women and men are at equal risk of bipolar disorder. Although women um, can have experienced rapid cycling and depressive symptoms and are at greater risk for comorbid alcohol abuse than men. There is no prevention. It's just oh, the best to get it treated, which is very, very difficult in the bipolar individual. So there are types of bipolar, bipolar 1, bipolar 2, and cyclothymic bipolar. I put this slide in because I, I liked how it presents it, um, but your text goes further. So your bipolar 1, this is many subtypes because it'll make sense as we go along because um, some are more on one side than on the other side as far as their um, presentation. So bipolar 1, according to your text, one or more manic episodes or mixed episodes and the course of illness is usually accompanied by major depressive episodes. So here it, it is more severe. It doesn't mean that they're always cycling back and forth between the manic and the depressive side, but they had to have had at least one manic episode. And there are some that go both ways. This is a more severe of the bipolars. Bipolar 2 is there a his, is a history of hypomanic episode, but no mania. So bipolar 1, they have to have had a, at least one manic episode. Bipolar 2, no manic episodes ever, and have to have had a hypomanic, you know, way down, no energy, no movement episode. Whoa. Sorry about that. Uh, we had a big bang. It turned out my transformer blew, so my power went out, and we had to put it on pause. <sighs> I'm trying to remember where I was. I know I talked about bipolar 1. I, I think I was on bipolar 2. <sighs> okay, so history of hypomanic episode, but no mania. I remember saying that. They can, no history of any manic hyper 
episodes and a his, there is a history of major depression. If you notice, the major depression is the same in both and the bipolar one has, has had a history of a manic episode and the bipolar two has a history of a hypomanic episode. Cyclothymic episodes of hypomania and numerous periods of depressed period, never symptom free. So the major depression that is present for bipolar one and by two, bipolar two have to meet the criteria that we discussed in exemplar 28A for major depression. And manic episodes for diagnosis of mania as bored as bipolar. Manic episodes last most of the day, every day, for at least a week. And then any duration of possibilities is required. So that's when I said a lot of people will claim to be bipolar. But those manic episodes last for at least a week. And has some combination of symptoms and behaviors to the extent that individuals change behavior are noticeable in impaired social or occupational functioning. Distractibility, racing thoughts like flight of ideas, psychomotor agitation, increase in goal-directed activity, pressured speech, distorted sleep patterns, and grandiosity. And none of the symptoms can be contributed to a different cause, a biological, medical cause. Okay. Um, let's get into here the next slide. On symptoms of mania or man manic episode. Talking very fast, jumping from one idea to another, having racing thoughts, being easily distracted, increasing goal-directed. Those are the things I mentioned, being restless, sleeping little, unrealistic belief in one's abilities, impulsive, and engage in high-risk behaviors. Excellent description for mania. It's abnormally and persistently elevated, expansive, and or irritable mood. Increased energy activity most of the time, nearly every day for seven days or more. As specific symptoms. Flight of ideas. It's a rapidly changing, fragmented thoughts, pressured speech, goal-directed activities. I had a patient, my very last patient, my very last three days working in ICU when I was... Uh, just graduated as a nurse practitioner and was taking my certification. And I had a young man that was bipolar and schizophrenic that had rhabdomyolysis due to medication. So he had to be taken off everything. That's very critical. So he was in ICU, but we couldn't give him anything, not an aspirin, not a tunnel, not any kind of medication. Everything had to be out of a system. And that's when I, first time I actually experienced flight of ideas. It was unlike anything. It's very difficult to describe. He would talk. He was so hyper that his mother gave him a tape recorder, and this is what he would use at home. He would record himself and listen to himself while he was still talking on something totally different. And it wasn't, no thought was complete and immediately went into Another thought to another thought, another thought, like, okay, if I'm going to read pieces of sentences here, this is what it would be. Abnormal, persistently elevated activities, less extreme depression characteristics are as follows. Yesterday, the sky was blue. I dreamt. Oh, God, I, I'm even having trouble doing it. I can't quite make myself go from a thought to a thought, but it's very, very fast. Pressured in that it's talk like there's, there's pressure behind it. It's so, so rapid, and the, the brain just doesn't stop. My, I, my son that I mentioned committed suicide was also bipolar, and he would have 
mania that would last for a week, sometimes even longer. And he would go three days easily with no food and no sleep. He would get very, very risky behaviors. Um, thought he was capable of anything artistic, wonderful to be around. And then the other, here's the depressive episodes. So the depressive episodes, feeling tired or slowed down, problems concentrating, remembering, making de decisions. As you remember, it is the symptoms of major depressive disorder. They could be restless or irritable because they're, they're so down. Change in eating, sleeping, or other habits where it tends to either overeat or not want to eat, sleeping too much, thinking of death or suicide or attempting suicide. Um, rapid, recycle, rapid cycling is two mood episodes within a year with partial or full remission of two months or more or immediate alternate periods, mania, hypomania, and depression. That's rapid cycling. I said I have this chart here, but your text also has a chart on page 1945. Um, it would help with what I already said. So hypomania, less extreme than mania. Individuals describe themselves as feeling wonderful and do not recognize changes in their behavior, although friends and family observe changes. Assess for safety, administer mood stabilizers, clinical therapies. But safety is a big thing, as you notice on every episode for the bipolar. I'm going to go back a second here. Cyclothymic disorder. Um, there, note in your textbook, free of severe symptoms that qualify for the diagnosis of manic disorder or major depressive disorder, often considered to be moody, unpredictable, or temperamental. And they may go on to develop more symptoms of either major depressive or manic intensity. These begin early, usually in adolescence or early adulthood. So, collaboration. There's diagnostic testing where they're actually looking to, through the whole patient history and ruling out any other possibility. Pharmacological therapy. Lithium is still a major major treatment for bipolar disorder. There's a lot of possible complications with it, but it's still like mainstay. Lithium alters the neurotransmitters in the ner central nervous system. It has a very, very narrow therapeutic window. A therapeutic window is it needs a therapeutic dose. It needs to be a certain level in your bloodstream to be therapeutic or have the effect, desired effect of the drug. A narrow therapeutic window means that there's just a narrow range. You, you need to get up to a certain level for it to work, to be effective, but you can't get, have it go too high or becomes very dangerous because of toxicity. There are a few drugs you will hear me say has a a narrow therapeutic window that and lithium is one of them whenever you hear that you're going to know you're going to be doing drug levels for this you could be watching for signs of toxicity and you're also going to watch for signs of effectiveness for it to be at a therapeutic range so lithium is contraindicated is should not be given to patients with impaired renal function congestive heart failure on sodium restricted diets or organic brain disease because the organic brain disease is because it is it works on the central nervous system and the reason for the sodium heart failure and sodium restricted because um, the lithium is a salt and also they get very 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 thirsty so you have to flood them with 
fluids. So you can't do that with a person with heart failure or renal failure or renal function impairment. So that's how you can remember that the people you don't want to give this medication to. The therapeutic level is 0 0.8 to 1.2. That's not very much range at all. Very narrow therapeutic window. Onset of action um, is usually a few weeks, two to three weeks. I think your text says one to three. I always think of a good three weeks for it to get to a therapeutic range. And then once it's they get to a therapeutic range, they want to try to keep it at a maintenance level of 0 0.6 to 1.2. You never want to go above. You want to keep it on the lower end of the therapeutic range as long as it is effective. Because it takes a while, usually when they've gone in an episode, they could be put on medications, they're hospitalized, and to get them managed while they're hospitalized, they will put them on some other medications, or sometimes they require additional medications, such as anti-seizure and atypical antipsychotic that we will talk about. Even though the... Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, let's see here. So your anti-seizure medications... Let me go further. I'm going to talk some more about lithium, and then I'll get into these other two classes of medications. So some good things with your lithium. Nursing implications taken after a meal. Increase fluid to three liters a day and sodium intake to three grams a day. There will be uh, NCLEX questions talking about lithium. And doing boot camp right now, we've already come across two in, our, in four days of review. So you want th at least three liters a day of fluids and three grams of sodium. You don't restrict either of those. That's why no heart failure patient, no impaired renal function patient, and nobody on a sodium-restricted diet. Avoid activities that increase perspiration because they're already losing, losing fluids. Never give to pregnant mothers. It's toxic to the baby. It takes 10 to 14 days before therapeutic, I would say at least two weeks, sometimes close to three. Antipsychotics administered during the first two weeks, which I mentioned, and there's your uh, serum level. Okay. Use with caution with lithium if they have thyroid disease. That was not in your text. Okay. So lithium toxicity, because it has a very narrow therapeutic range, really watch for toxic toxicity. Mild to moderate toxic reactions are diarrhea, vomiting, drowsiness, muscular weakness, lack of coordination, and dry mouth. So anti-seizure medications used in bipolar, the three valproic acid, brand name is Depakote, um, I'm a trigene, I've always called it Lamictal, I think that's probably because it's easier for me to say, carbamazepine or Tegretol. I've seen all three used with bipolar and sometimes it's used in combination with other things. So they all have therapeutic ranges, but you notice 50 to 125 is a very broad range. 2.5 to 15, 4 to 12. Nothing like the lithium with its very narrow. So anybody that is on one of these anti-seizure meds that is also used in bipolar because of the central nervous system depression that you get with this of impacting your nervous system, um, they will have drug levels drawn but not so worry about the toxic levels. All three cause drowsiness, fatigue, and weight gain. Uh, a Depakote valproic acid was a biggie on weight gain. Never discontinue any of these medications abruptly. They have to be weaned off. The only one of these that can be given in pregnancy is Lamictal, Lamitrigine, Trigene. Valproic acid, carbamazepine, and lithium are all contraindicated in pregnancy. So if you have, were given a case, a scenario, and bipolar needs to go on medications or needs to adjust the medications because they just found out they're pregnant 
you would pick the lamotrigine or labictal. And back to this. I'm not going to ask you therapeutic levels for these three, but understand that they need therapeutic levels and that blood's, blood will be drawn. But you do need to know it for your lithium and your lithium toxicity symptoms. So atypical antipsychotic mood stabilizers. You will see these again. You'll see all the other meds. You'll see the the seizure meds, when we talk about seizures, you'll see these meds later in mental health because we will be talking about psychosis, different types of psychosis. So, aripiprazole or abilified, risperidine or risperidol, olanzapine, cyprexa. I will probably give you both names on your exams used to just do the generic because that's all NCLEX was doing. Now, then they started doing brand names in parentheses, and I've heard with the changes in NCLEX that they may give you a generic and they may give you a brand. So, so there may be more than one brand name for a specific generic, but I'm going to try to give you the most common brand name to help you out in your learning. Not so much the anti-seizure, well, sorry, scratch that. Your antipsychotics are often given in conjunction with the anti-seizure, anti-convulsive meds that I just covered. Your text mentions another antipsychotic, Zyprasidone or Geodon. I don't know that I've seen that given that much for bipolar, unless I guess with the manic episodes when they're hospitalized. Um, it's bipolar. They're, oh, so the atypical antipsychotics are becoming first line treatment for bipolar mania. Which I wasn't aware of that. Okay, so next slide. Antipsychotic adverse effects, there's a lot of them. Tardive dyskinesia and neuroleptic malignant syndrome are things that you should learn to recognize. You will see these on other medications, on these medications when we cover them later, but also on um, like tardive dyskinesia with some other medications also. So your symptoms of tardive dyskinesia is movements of the mouth, rapid movement of the body, the face, the eyes, difficulty breathing, difficulty swallowing, difficulty speaking. If you notice this, other than the rapid movement of the body, most of this is like in in your face. People I've seen, it's like they're twitching, their tongue is going, their, their side of their face is twitching, they're blinking, that uh, tardive dyskinesia. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome, they don't know exactly how it happens. It's, it has to do with blocking the dopamine. And there's a sudden drop in the central nervous system dopamine activity. So they have muscle rigidity, impaired heat regulation, altered mental status. Be able to recognize neuroleptic malignant syndrome and tardive dyskinesia. Know those are things that you will teach a patient in your teaching to look for these things because they need to know what to report, when to call, call 911, when it's dangerous. Lifespan considerations. Children present with mood and behavior changes. They're overly silly or joyful, talking too much, little sleep but not tired. Lengthy or violent temper tantrums grandiose plans of these things they're going to do in their future and how they're, they're so smart, they're so good, they're so they can jump all over this wall. Um, difficult to diagnose due to differing developmental stages. Like with my son, they said uh, it was behavior problems, it was attention deficit, it was attention deficit hyperactive disorder, then he was ADHD with major depression, it was all over the place and finally diagnosed at 14 after I can remember how many suicide attempts and hospitalizations. Adolescence, average age of onset is 18. 
differentiate typical mood swings from bipolar because adolescents will have moodiness and swings because of hormones. So they have to be distinguished because again, you have to rule out other causes. Pregnant women, although they are bipolar or may or may not have even been diagnosed before the pregnancy, but they are five to 10 times more likely to have some sort of episode during pregnancy. Um, monitor fetus as well as mother and if they're on lithium, you're assessing for heart defects because often they will be on this lithium before they find out they're pregnant. So if you have a bipolar on lithium, bipolar female on lithium, you, you don't want her to get pregnant. So birth control using multiple, more than one form barrier and everything. Okay, older adults rule out medical causes and substance abuse. They often will need a lower dose of medications. Lithium is, con again, contraindicated if they have kidney disease and used with caution if they have a thyroid disease, hyper or hypothyroid, and rule out medical causes for their mood swings. Let's get into the nursing process. Assessment, diagnosis, planning, implementation, and evaluation. So your assessment, you're going to do a physical exam, um, patient interview. You're observing for their behaviors and you're asking them questions because you're looking for past manic or depressive episodes, their behaviors, ask about their symptoms, and their severity with their hypomania or manic, if it's a frank, obvious manic episode. Um, ask questions to narrow down how often the symptoms occur, how long they last. Do they uh, onset, is it gradual or is it very dramatic? First manic episode often occurs in the late teens or early 20s, although it can occur earlier or later. And looking for the specific things that we talked about for diagnosing, such as their delusions of persecution, like everybody's against them, or grandeur, um, ignoring or saying they don't get fatigued or hungry, Maybe they're not even taking care of their hygiene. Loud, rapid, pressured speech may or may not have flight of ideas. Um, irritability, changes in their moods. They may be very expressive as in dressing where it's, it's uh, flashy, uh, tons of makeup on. They don't understand why people think they have a problem. Or they might say that I can't keep up with my thoughts, that they're going all over the place. I say that because I was on mega doses of prednisone for six or eight months before they were able to lower it. And I did not sleep, barely ate, had incredible weight loss. And that's probably the closest I came to having a clue, a little glimmer of what it's like to be manic because my thoughts were all over the place and that's what I tell told my rheumatologist is I can't keep up with my own thoughts although I I it was not manic and I, I can't imagine what it's like to go through that mania of course you're going to do a physical assessment you're looking for constant motor activity as part of your physical assessment looking for weight loss sleep disturbances bruises because they're in constant activity and don't Safety is not on their radar whatsoever. Um, family members can probably give you an awful lot of information to explain, to get a detail of their behavior. So diagnosis. The text gives you some at risk for injury, impaired social interactions, ineffective impulsive control, impaired mood regulation, impaired nutrition, less than body requirements, uh, self-care deficit, sleep deprivation, and risk for suicide. 
uh, your planning your planning is outcomes for mood disorders include expectations to return to normal functioning you're hoping they can remain free of injury uh, remain oriented use appropriate behaviors in a variety of settings maintain self-esteem so whatever you pick you have your symptoms you choose a couple of diagnoses and then you plan per diagnosis have let's move on to the next slide so your implementation so you see all these symptoms and you pull a couple of diagnoses. So you do risk for injury as one of your diagnoses. So your plans are going to be remain injury free and you're going to implement things such as promote patient safety specific to your remain free injury. You may have increased rest and sleep as, as your diagnosis for sleep deprivation. I mean, as your implementation or it can go in several of these these processes here um, the nurse needs to speak matter-of-factly communicate limitations you have to be firm there needs to be a firmness but not rudeness but you, but you can't you can't sway um, the nurse puts safety, patient safety, as a priority with your implementation and your planning. Promote reality-based thinking. You don't argue. You don't tell them that's not reality. But you could say, I understand something like, I'm going to be the president. I understand you hope to be the president or feel you're capable of being the president. Right now, you are in the hospital and we're going to help you or you're under care or something so you don't deny go against them you acknowledge what they're saying and then give them reality without cutting them down promote improved self-care um, setting limits is on there let's see page 1949 in your text has a nursing care plan of a patient with bipolar so it gives you your assessment, it gives you diagnosis, planning, all the different things for this particular case that they're going to use for implementation. So that's really good to look at to help you get into this uh, whole ADPI nursing process and then next semester or in your med surge doing your concept maps. Your evaluation right here, remain injury free for perform self-care, sleep through the night, behave appropriately. So as you're writing these up in your care plans, in your uh, care plans or your concept maps, make your goals of your outcomes on the care plan I gave you specific, measurable, achievable, realistic time frame. Okay. So you're going to have long-term, short-term. Your short-term during today, during this hospitalization, during this week, and long-term goals as they are as, as outpatients or whatever scenario I give you, but three months, six months, even one month as long-term goals. Okay, so that is the end of this presentation, and I apologize for the stop in the middle of it.